Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. This is a really, I think this is such an important book and it's very, very timely with where we are um, with the climate crisis right now. Tonight we'll be celebrating Stephen Pine's newest release, uh, Pyrocene. And as a UC, a, a UC alum, I'm ex especially excited to host this event because it's a UC Press publication, which is so nice. Um, so our author tonight, Stephen, as I mentioned, is a professor with uh, Arizona State University, correct? Yeah. Uh, and I'm professor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and a MacArthur Fellow and author of many books about the history and management of fire. In conversation with Steve tonight, we have David, the president of California <clears throat> State Park Rangers Association and a, retired, and a retired park ranger as well, and an, an author in his own right of 13 nonfiction books. So before I pass it off, <laughs> I do want to mention that we'll be taking questions near the end, but you can put them in the chat at any point in time, uh, and then we'll go through those about 10 minutes before the end of the event. So yeah, let's pass it off to Steve and David, who I think have presentations for us as well. Well, thank you very much. Um... <laughs> What a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and I hope we hope we all have a good night. I have a few slides. We discussed uh, as we were preparing. Where, excuse me. Yeah, <clears throat> that may help uh, introduce the subject. What is the pyrocene? Uh, the pyrocene is my term for a long Anthropocene, that is the period in which humans increasingly dominated the planet. And my particular perspective is through fire, the alliance of humanity and fire, uh, uh, an enormous tag team that has reshaped the planet for a long time and is continuing to do it rather vehemently recently. Well, fire has been on uh, the earth as long as terrestrial vegetation. We have charcoal dating 420 million years plus back. But my real focus begins about two and a half million years ago with the Pleistocene, um, an ice age driven by uh, the orientation of the planet relative to uh, the sun. Some of the prominent features, glace, glaciation, uh, much of it continental. About 80% of the Pleistocene was glacial. About 90% of the last million years has been in ice. And the, below we can see uh, atmospheric CO2, but it's also a temperature gauge. And you can see these warm periods, short, sharp warm periods that then give way to longer periods of ice. And our present period is, is racing well beyond what had been before. Well, fire is a property of the living world. Life created the oxygen, life creates and rearranges the fuel. And then during the Pleistocene, uh, a creature acquired the ability to capture fire and begin using it. And much of that use depended simply on ignition, the ability, the timing and placing of fire, uh, which could then, in a sense, capture and redirect those places that were all that already were predisposed towards fire. And then we add to that firepower by agriculture in various forms, by cutting fuels, draining uh, peat, uh, loosing livestock, all kinds of things that expand the domain of fire. But all of that has been in living landscapes and it comes with checks and balances. You can only do so much before the system breaks down. But if you want more firepower, you have to find more stuff to burn. And we found it by going into the geologic past or what I have taken to calling lithic landscapes that is once living, now lithified uh, into coal, um, gas, petroleum, and so forth. And this transition uh, really puts the whole process of the pyrocene on afterburners. And one of the things it does is it changes the emphasis from sources, finding stuff to burn, to sinks, where do we put all the effluent from all the burning? And it removes all of the old baffles and barriers. There are essentially no checks and balances. You can burn day and night, winter and summer, wet or dry, it doesn't matter. So we've simply overloaded 
all of the ecological processes that had previously governed fire. And then we use this transition to replace open flame almost everywhere. We've replaced it domestically. We've replaced it in cities, modern cities used to burn as often as the surrounding countryside, they were made of the same materials. Now we've shifted. Agriculture, most agriculture out of floodplains and even some in floodplains used fire, but most outside relied on fire or a cycle of fire to reset the succession of plants. Uh, and in effect, uh, use fire to fumigate and fertilize and so on. And now we use petrochemicals, most of it delivered by some, some machine powered by fossil fuels. So again, we've remade all of these different habitats. And what about wildlands? Uh, we crack open. These are all from the United States. The one in the upper right are uh, coastal redwoods converted to dairy farms. And we have this explosion of, um, of burning mega fires, really an order of magnitude larger and more lethal than what we've seen in recent years. This led to state-sponsored conservation, which took the form primarily of fire exclusion. Fighting fires that started, preventing fires uh, from starting, discouraging people uh, from using fire, uh, and even you know, in how we fight fire. This is how it was done, say, in the plains in the mid uh, 19th century, using fire to set burnouts, um, finding ways to control the flames. And today it's going to be something like this. It's impossible to imagine modern firefighting without fossil fuels and the machines that run on them. So we are using this in effect as a counterforce. And this has caused all kinds of disruptions apart from the atmosphere and so forth. And all of this happened even in the absence of climate change. Uh, the federal agencies began reforming their fire policy in the 1960s and 70s, that is 50 years ago, uh, simply based on the problems that were being created by eliminating fire in places that were accustomed to it and in fact needed it. So going back to the Pleistocene, we had lots of ice-informed landscapes, perhaps the most famous features, but we had lots of paraglacial stuff lakes, permafrost, uh, outwash plains, and so forth. We had a drop in sea level. We had waves of mass extinctions, and we had a creature that acquired the ability to feed fire, manipulate fire, and use it. We are a creation um, of the ice ages. But then the pyrocene were shifting. We were replacing the Milankovitch cycles with um, industrial combustion, the ice is disappearing almost everywhere. Uh, we're replacing it with fire-informed biotas. Large biogeographical shifts appear to be underway. We've got ancillary landscapes, uh, which we don't really have names for. I can invent a few, but I'm wondering if these giant smoke poles, for example, are the equivalent, the dynamic equivalent of outwashed plains and other features that were associated. Uh, with the ice sheets. We have a rise in sea level, we have mass extinctions, and we have humans, the uniquely fire creature, in a very different relationship to fire. This is the Fort McMurray fire in Canada, very interesting one because Fort McMurray exists to mine tar sands. Uh, at the same time, it is now facing fires uh, coming out of the boreal forest. And here they are fleeing in their cars. It's remarkable how many of the scenes are of cars or of, of uh, gas trucks coming into the, um, having to deliver fuel so they can escape from their own fires. So welcome to the Pyrocene, coming to a planet near you. And that is essentially what the book is about, is explaining how this happened and then ending with some uh, prospects for the future and suggestions of things we could do. And with that, I suggest I turn it over to David, or if you like uh, Cyan, uh, I'd be happy to suggest some other stuff. Cyan? Maybe I think I... Her, her, she's muted. Maybe, <laughs> David, why don't, you do, why don't you do it? And then we, we've got sort of the macro view, the planetary view, and you can bring it to California or whatever yeah. else you'd like. And... 
Okay, so let me do the, what you did. I, let me let me share my screen here. If I can make this work. Okay, and then it is the. There's the slideshow option. Sorry about that. So, so, so let's see, you're seeing too much. You're seeing more than I want to show. Yeah. Well, phooey. Um, I should have tested this further. Um, so let me just say, um, you're looking at the cover. Can, can you see what I'm talking about? You've got some extra pictures mm -hmm. over on the left, but the, the cover of the, the book that I just had published, Oct August 20th, another UC Press book, it's called Introduction to Fire in California. And it's the second edition of a book that I, I wrote originally 13 years ago. And um, it uh, was UC Press asked me to do something about, uh, to recognize what, what's been changing. So let's see if I can do it this way. Yeah, this will work. Um, yeah. It's really in five sections, and, and it's a natural history book, in a sense. Um, at, at least it opens that way. It's, uh, it, it talks about some of the things Steve just talked about, about the nature of fire. What is fire? It answers that question. And then moves on to a look at fire and fire ecosystems, the, the fire ecology that's, that we understand from decades now of, of, of research, um, really a century across California. So um, not just forested areas, not just uh, Sierra Nevada areas, but uh, coast, coast range, shrublands, chaparral, um, uh, grasslands, the desert, all of these different areas, uh, what we know about fire and, and the different species and, and vegetation that are adapted to fire in different ways uh, under those conditions. And then there's a middle section that uh, is, is very much uh, related to some of the things that, that uh, Steve Pine's book uh, talks about that's focused on history and you know how, what, what happened in California specifically um, in terms of uh, the, the fire regimes that uh, we just had talked about in the natural history portion, um, but how the Aboriginal people of California uh, used fire and, and related to fire, and then on through the changes that began over a century ago with the, the, the policy changes. And um, then the book moves on to burning issues, to, to issues that are the challenges. And the final part of the book uh, basically tries to talk about you know, how we're addressing those challenges. And I have three pictures here that are part of the history section, but they're also part of this topic of, of um, of fire exclusion and trying to restore fire to uh, areas that uh, really um, became fire starved and, were, and needed it. This is a scene um, that has some relevance tonight as we are watching fire threatening uh, giant sequoia trees in the uh, um, Sequoia National Park and the Sequoia National Forest. But this scene is in Yosemite National Park, and it says here 1890. It's in the Mariposa Grove, and take a look first of all at the sizes. The little those little people are normal sized <laughs> people. These are incredible trees, and and take a look for to compare here in a moment as I move forward. This fire scar um, that this tree successfully dealt with fire uh, in its very very long life. Um, so by 1970. Okay, 1890 to 1970, 80 years uh, or the National Park Service um, basically was living within this concept of excluding fire. This is the same angle at the same, most of the giant sequoias in that first shot are invisible because young fir trees have, or grew up around them. And the trees at this point, the giant sequoias are incredibly threatened by uh, what once was a safe thing for giant sequoia and an important thing. Um, so that's all spelled out. What I'm talking about is in the book, but uh, that uh, ground fires were, were not an issue. But today, in, or in 1970, at this point in time, ground fires would climb up uh, through this ladder of fuels and, and, <laughs> and into the crowns of the trees. And so happily, by... Um, this picture is taken in 2018. Around 1970, the, the National Park Service, Yosemite, and also down in Sequoia National Park, 
began to recognize the need for fire to be returned. And they, uh, of course, had to do it very carefully at first. Um, they didn't just reintroduce fire back under those conditions that we saw in 1970. And um, some of the things that may make for a successful story in what's happening with the KNP fire complex that's burning today down, down in the Sequoia uh, is because of this kind of treatment. Um, first thinning, uh, then Put, allowing fire to come back, burning piles probably at first, and then allowing broadcast fire to move around these trees again as it, as it had in the past, and, and uh, often enough to, con to control those understory incursions. So that is part of the, one of the best examples I, I can show people of challenges that have, that have uh, grown up in the last century in relation to our fire policy and what it has meant in certain kinds of, of fire um, plant communities in California. And then the, the next section of the book is called Getting Ready, Life on the Edge. And it's a reference to the this wildland urban edge, the interface between wildlands and, and people things. And more and more people, 40 million people almost now in California, and a very large number of them more and more frequently living out in uh, places where there's very high fire risk. And so a, a very dramatic image here of a roof fire. Um, one of the things the book can do is run through uh, uh, the recommendations that, that are out there for uh, how to construct homes that will deal with fire better in these areas, how to harden homes that are already exist, but maybe need the roofs change, the materials on their walls change, the, the decks that uh, allow fire to come in underneath them. This is a real nice example of uh, a home where near where I live in the Eastern Sierra. And finally, the need for this book was um, because so many uh, interesting recent things, especially in the last decade, and particularly in the last three years, uh, we had, most everyone knows, we had enormous mega fires that have shown up. There's strong connections to what's happening with the climate crisis on the globe now. Uh, we've had, this is, a, this is an, an image that uh, from uh, 2020 up in Napa Valley and um, COVID had came along and, and very much complicated the ability of the fire agency people uh, to deal with and the ability of society to deal with evacuation centers and all of those things. That's just one of the, the things that uh, prompt that this that's really uh, changed. Um, the, the climate story is a very important part of that, but it, also the book covers things like the uh, public safety power shutoffs and, and how those came about and how they've worked and where we are and the insurance issues that people face when they live in these areas now and not, not able to get it and a whole host of things. So it's an introduction to fire in a broad, broad sense in California. So that's it. That's what I've got. Let me stop sharing and we can talk. I love this picture. Noah, Noah yeah. Bergen was the photographer. <clears throat> so, you know, there, there's actually a nice parallel between COVID and fire threatening communities. Uh, I mean, fire spreads by contagion. It's a kind of pyric contagion or combustion contagion. And the way you defend against it um you harden your houses well that's like uh, against against primarily embers that's like wearing a mask uh social distancing well that's uh defensible space and then herd immunity is something you get when the, when enough of the community is protected to keep the fire from propagating through and you know in some ways fire is is like a virus that it's not alive but it depends on the living world and one of the issues I tried to develop in the pirate scene is to remind us uh, that fire is a creation of the living world. And we too rarely think about solutions uh, that are sort of ecological engineering. Uh, we think of fire as a physical chemical problem. And so we meet it with physical countermeasures, uh, which is fine when it's blowing and going, but I don't think has shown itself to be effective um, for large-scale landscape management. I want to read a couple of Steve's 
sentences <laughs> in his book. He may want to read these, but I, these, these just really grabbed me. Um, this is towards the end of the book. Um, we don't need new science or more science. We already know what needs to happen. In truth, we used to know much of it before we got greedy and forgot. And uh, on the cross of the page, there's another sentence. We face a long, painful hangover from our overindulgence of fossil fuels. Very good, Steve. And it relates to, I think, what you just said. And uh, finally, towards the end, you'd say, we'll need a lot more good fire of all kinds, a ritual of burning that has no end, that will con or it will continue forever. So um, there's good language in there. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. I hope there's some good, good thoughts as well. I mean, one of the points I'm trying to make is that as w when we converted to fossil fuels, uh, we didn't do it selectively. I mean, it would have been fine if we did it for houses and towns. We, we began making over the entire planet. Uh, and so the problem is not just climate change as a result of fossil fuels, it's how we live on the land, how we do everything, how we even fight fires. So that makes it very difficult. Uh, because fire is integrating all the things, all the ways we live, how we build our towns, how we get our power, uh, how we organize our landscape around us. Um, so that makes it complicated. But I also think it makes it, it gives us some opportunities. It means that there are many points of entry. It's not just one thing that is causing the mega fires. Uh, it is a whole bunch of things. And, the way in which we have disrupted uh, the whole the whole pattern of fire and indeed our relationship to fire. I mean, for all of our existence as a species, we have had fire. There was a period of time when when several other hominids coexisted and also had fire. Now there's only us. So we're it. You know, fire is is what we do that nobody else does. This is our ecological signature. Uh, so it's time we recaptured it. So. You know, I think of fire as a kind of like a driverless car. It's just barreling down the road. It's integrating everything around it. And different things at different times loom large. Maybe a sharp curve called climate change, or it may be you know, a tricky intersection where town and country come together, or it might be a lot of road hazard left over from a period of massive logging or land clearing. But it's integrating all those things. So I think there are lots of points of intervention possible. We just... And you know, I'm glad you picked those sections, David. I don't think I would have, uh, because we do know enough to begin. We've we've known it, uh, and we know plenty to begin. Uh, obviously, the world is changing around us. Uh, so as we begin, uh, our treatments, our our efforts to sort of mitigate uh, what's coming at us. Um, there will be surprises and so forth, but um, and we will have to adapt to it. But we know more. We know more than we need to begin the process. I mean, there's no reason for 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 houses to burn down like this, or communities. We solved that problem a hundred years ago, and then we forgot. You know, it, it, for me, it's like watching polio come back. Hey, we fixed this. Well, we decided that it had gone away, it wasn't a problem anymore. So we didn't need to practice sort of pyrrhic hygiene. Uh, and we could pretend that these communities are not really cities. So we don't need to. Um, but if we redefine them, yeah, you know, the urban wildland interface got defined by the wildland community. And so it was seen as a problem of houses, communities moving into wildlands, but it could have just as easily been defined by the other half that these are really urban fires with funny landscaping. And if you define it that way, it's pretty clear what you have to do. I mean, it's not really an issue. It's complicated if you're dealing with wildlands and all these other issues. It's really not that hard otherwise. And it's ridiculous that, you know, we've had this creaky electric grid for, we've known about for decades, it needs to be upgraded and redesigned. And now we're to the point where, I mean, starting mega fires, it's taking out communities, um, utilities are going bankrupt, uh, we're spending tens of billions, 
after the fact. I mean, really, this is where we're to. This is a fixable problem. It's primarily an infrastructure problem. We can add fire to rehabilitating a lot of things that we need to anyway. So it is not so immense that we can't. Ultimately, we have to get a handle on climate change or it will overwhelm all the others. But w there are plenty of things we could do. We could keep communities from burning if we chose within a handful of years. And we could rehab a lot of our surrounding wildlands and countryside in a handful of decades if we chose to. Climate change is going to be a harder slog, but I, we need to do all of that at the same time. I, th I think you would like to join this, David. <laughs> you seem to be. <laughs> on several things as you spoke, that are, and, but one of them uh, about the, the, you know, what is what is urban and, and how does it relate to <laughs> the wildfires that come in? Um, there's a, I used a quote in my book of a, a woman whose home burned in the Oakland Hills fire in 1991. And um, mm -hmm. well, the Oakland Hills are, were, you know, very, not not side-by-side -side homes, not that kind of tract housing, but homes up on the hillside above the Oakland Flats where things were much more packed, much more uh, really, really urban, but all kinds of vegetation too, um, especially, um, things like eucalyptus trees. And when this fire got going, it came blowing in off of the wildlands at the top of the mountain and over the other side of the mountain, came into, out of the east. One, another, another pattern that we're seeing, by the way, is, is shifting and, and more ex extreme winds that are tied in with this climate change. But anyway, this fire now is, is rather old, but it came down and, and it what and it in rapidly moved into an urban area. We had something sort of like this in Santa Rosa, rapidly moving mm -hmm. into an urban edge of Santa Rosa a few years ago, much more recently. But the Oakland fire was horrible because it um, people tried to evacuate late in the process. The roads got congested and then the traffic stopped and then the fire came over and killed, I forget, 90 people or something. Um, horrible disaster. The disaster, uh, and, and, and then the quote, the woman said, you would have thought I was little Led Red Riding Hood living out in the woods. She said, we had sidewalks. How could this happen? You know, um, and, and the point is that, uh, you know, educating all of us through, through books like these um, and other things, other measures, is, is really important so that we understand where we live and what we and are real about it and we don't you know think we're living in something that's totally under control um and even even berkeley downtown berkeley had one of the biggest disastrous fires in the in the early 20th century um and um you know southern california you know we're talking to los angeles uh, bookstore here and, and i I don't know where everybody's from, but you know, I grew up down there, and uh, down there, it's it's uh, you know, it, it, everybody knows that the chaparral hillsides are are uh, where a lot of the development occurred, and the chaparral fires, the fall wind driven fires, um, incredible heat release, incredible fire flame lengths, um, are are the big issue down there, and. Uh, um, and yet, and so what am I saying? I, I keep coming back to, yeah, we can tackle all of the different challenges in here, but we have got so many people now in California. I'm focused on the state, obviously, and you can talk beyond that, but um, every one of these issues uh, uh, from ignition for, by people, but also um, in terms of what, what makes a disaster when a fire comes, has to do with the, the presence of a lot of us living on this landscape and maybe not appreciating the where we are in the way that uh, people did in in the past the the people the early people of California. Well, I find it peculiar that mega fires, if you look around the world, are restricted pretty much to developed countries or countries that are rapidly developing. This is not a third world problem. Uh, there are problems with land clearing and conversion and using fire uh, to burn up the debris or to burn down the peat if it's been drained. 
But these kinds of magnifiers are a particular pathology of developed countries. Um, I think that partly because they have forgotten how they used to live with fire. And for a period of time, we could find surrogates for all the things fire did. We don't experience fire routinely. I mean, even at my university, when I was still teaching, students were prohibited from having candles in their dormitories. Okay, fine, but how are they going to learn about fire? Uh, one of my favorite images, the first image we have of Australian Aborigines from Cook's first expedition, shows a family returning from um, fishing, and there's a father and a mother, and then a small kid behind following along, and he has a fire stick, which is flaming away. And oh, of course, how is he going to learn about it if he doesn't use it? Now, I'm not advocating that we hand out torches and matches to all of our kids. The point is that we have forgotten how we used to do that. We have, there's an old idea of through human artifice and ingenuity, we made a second nature out of raw nature. And I think with our transition into a kind of fossil fuel uh, world, we've made a third nature and we've forgotten how to live even in second nature. Um, because we had done this successfully for so long. Uh, and you had big fires when there were major social breakdowns from famine or war uh, or uh, some kind of revolution. And people were no longer tending uh, the landscape. They were no longer caring for it. They were no longer setting domesticated or quasi tame fires uh, to prevent wildfires from coming. But then we've made a transition. We don't experience that anymore. And we've sort of forgotten, and we're having to relearn it. And this is a rather painful way to do it. But uh, I do think much you know, disastrous as some of these fires are when they move into communities, um, I think there's widespread recognition that simply doubling or tripling the size of our firefighting forces is not going to stop them. We have got to rethink the relationship and how we live on the land. I think that's what you're saying. You're, you're, I'm, I'm putting it, see, this is the problem of being an, being an academic. You're sort of trained to think abstractly. You wanna generalize things. You look at lots of stuff, you try to find a large principle and that's very satisfying. But then at some point we also have to bring it down. It has to be regrounded. And uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad we're paired, Dave, because <laughs> Uh, so, you can give very practical California examples. <laughs> well, and, and my writing, my books, I've written four of these introduction to various topics in natural history for UC Press. One about water, one about air, one about earth, and the other one, this fire book. And, and each one um, is trying to take uh, what you just said about how we need to, to go back and, and understand but what, what I know of that a person who is a Californian living wherever um, may go, well, how, these, are, these are broad, I, I'm not gonna become a fire ecologist. So what I would hope that one part of this book goes through these various parts of California. And if you live in the coast range of Southern California or Northern California, or if you live in the Sierra Nevada foothills, or in the desert or down in the Central Valley, wherever you live, there's a, there's a plant regime that's natural, the vegetation regime. And those plants, um, because fire is part of, has always been part of the environment, um, uh, those plants have their specific adaptations depending on just how much fire they have to adapt to, uh, to respond to, to, recover from. Um, and um, so you can, you don't have to know it all, but it might help to know that if you live in uh, in a knob cone pine forest uh, or in a, in a uh, you know, foothill, savanna, oak woodland, grassland area, that there is information about that you can understand about what's outside your, in your neighborhood. What is the natural fire regime? What are the fire return intervals? How long has it been since fire came through in those lands closest to where you live. And maybe then you are on your way to starting to, to, to recover, become one of the, I, I'd like to see, I think 
Stephen Pine's book talks about some of this. Um, I think we'd both like to see uh, that humans return to being one of the fire adapted species in a in a state on uh, a planet uh, that's full of fire adapted species and uh, and not you know try to be something else uh, try to be something that that is is just in battle with fire well we do have examples of success um, the southeast particularly florida has led the country in uh defining what prescribed fire that deliberately set controlled fires can do. That is a foundational strategy. Uh, we have some examples in uh, tall grass prairie and other sites for nature protection. Uh, we have, and I last week I had a chance to uh, be at Yosemite to join a, a trek into the back country to Illouette Creek, which is sort of uh, elevated basin south of Half Dome. And this was set up 50 years ago to begin restoring natural fire. And so this was a celebration, 50 years of success. They haven't had as much as they would like. Nobody has as much burning or the right kind of fire uh, exactly. But this is an area that more or less succeeded. And they've been able to protect the Mariposa Grove. Uh, they still have some other groves to treat. But this is sort of the back country. This is the wild. Yosemite had always been defined by the valley and the, and the grove, the great Mariposa Grove. And both of these, the records of these, when they were first visited by whites, was of annual burning. I mean, just regular, routine burning, uh, purposeful, not simply, is not vandalism, but burned so often that large, wildfires could not penetrate into them or damage them. And then as a result of the Wilderness Act and the Leopold Report for the Park Service, we created a third part in the park. 95% of the park is now wilderness. So Illawood Creek is sort of the wild side. And so they were able to bring that third facet uh, into a kind of management regime, which is a nice contrast with some of what's going around the park. Now, some of the areas lower elevation have, have different have different kinds of fires and harder problems, but it showed that they could that you can do it if you choose to and you go about it with persistence. And for me, it was a great Yosemite was a great part of the attraction too, was a great illustration of the piracy. Here is a place that is famous for its glacial sculpting. This is a place that was made. By ice and in John Muir's Mountains of California, everything is re ultimately references the ice. That is the that is the fount of all of the of the soils, the distribution of trees, the character of the rocks, all of it. And yet now it's becoming a place shaped by fire. A century after the arm after it became a national park in 1890, for the first time in its history, the park was closed because of fires outside the entrance and El Portal and Foresta, uh, the steamboat fires. Uh, then it was later closed because of smoke, heavy smoke coming in that exceeded uh, dangerous air quality limits and was having to pose. So we see a place that was shaped by ice and is now increasingly being shaped by fire. So I thought that transition was something that, a kind of cameo, if you will, uh, for what I'm arguing is happening with the planet. There, uh, there's a sociological story here that I guess uh, uh, we all need to pay attention to too as we as we talk policy, uh, and I think a, 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 a test of, of different approaches uh, that's being played out right now down in Sequoia National Park and Sequoia National Forest. Um, and they've already had several of the sequoia groves in Sequoia National Forest overrun by, I think it's called the Windy Fire in this last few days. And the latest I've heard, we'll see how the, the next, how the reports come out, but, but uh, the work that the Park Service has done in Sequoia National Park for decades seems to be paying off in terms of protection for most of those endangered uh, giant sequoias where, the, where that uh, fire complexes has, has, has come through. So um, 
why is there a difference that the Forest Service uh, has uh, not as aggressively uh, implemented uh, this change policy that I demonstrated in those pictures of the Mariposa Grove as the National Park Service has? That Not that they haven't done work, but that they I visited um, several of their sequoia groves and, and been shocked to see the understory that still existed um, as recently as just in the last decade. So um, there, there's a test here, and, and it, it's not it's not to blame the Forest Service exactly, but um, there has been an inner internal resistance in that agency and others, um, and it's been difficult uh, for, for us to move. It's amazing how long it's taken since the 1960s and 70s for us to a uh, half century later to still be arguing about whether it is, is beneficial to do to reintroduce fire to these landscapes. Well, in many ways, the modern American story of wildland fire begins in 1910 with the, the big blow up in the northern Rockies and it's the trauma it inflicted on the forest service and we spent the next 50 years trying to take fire out of landscapes and since then, we've spent the last 50 years trying to put good fire back in. And it turns out it's a whole lot easier to take it out than to put it back. Well, I wonder if we're uh, ready for some questions. Yeah. Yeah, we can open the floor up for questions. Uh, we have one from David for Steve. Do you think that intelligent life could have developed without fire? And what would intelligent life look like on a planet without fire? <laughs> wow. Are you writing a sci-fi? <laughs> well, there are some who would say, <laughs> we, we don't have intelligent life. We're still waiting for it. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's plenty of evidence that, you know, whales and, and porpoises. Uh, ocean life can be, is intelligent. Uh, we're finding all kinds of intelligence in giraffe, excuse me, in elephants and other creatures. When we start looking, it's partly a matter of definition. Um, I, one of the interesting questions for me is, uh, did, did a creature or creatures in earlier times of Earth history, say uh, the Jurassic or Cretaceous period, which were awash with dinosaurs, uh, did one of them acquire the ability uh, to start fires? I mean, the thought of a velociraptor with that could <laughs> that could manipulate fire is uh, is pretty horrifying. But How I don't know why Universal it, it couldn't Studios have any ideas? <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's start. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. We're we're the only planet that we know that has fire. And right now, we are the only creature that can manipulate fire in a systematic way. There are, there are accounts of some raptors in northern Australia that have been seen to pick up burning branches or things and then redeposit them. And the reason is that these fires in the, those uh, savannas set up a kind of fire drive. So lots of creatures are running away from the fire. Uh, there are lots of insects that are being caught in the uh, plume. And so birds are coming in and picking off the insects and then the wedge-tailed eagles and, and um, hawks are picking off other stuff as it comes. So this whole fire drive. So you can see all the things we do with fire, nature gave us the example for. Um, so, but apart from that, we're uniquely fire creatures on a uniquely fire planet. Uh, this is really our signature. Uh, and it's it's sort of a, a species shame that we are managing it so badly. Can I just sort of finish off that? Yeah, please, we, please. Yeah, you know, well, because well, because I just said some things critical of the Forest Service, and and um, I, I want to also say that it. it it is, uh, there's incredible disasters and incredible uh, destruction that, uh, you know, families and people um, have been killed and their property destroyed. And, and um, we recognize that. Um, and there's no simple fix for it. That's why 
all of this discussion needs to happen. Um, and, and that's not to say that one agency has made some policy decisions that necessarily are the answer to what happened in a given fire. Um, you know, lots of lots of things get argued about, but I, I don't want to forget that. You know, while we're saying we should, we can, we should, and must do better be, to avoid these disasters and this this destruction. Yeah. Um, you know, that's why we must do better. It's part of that story. Is why we must do better. And um, you know, here we are. We've got to. We've got to. We've got to become a fire adapted species. The National Park Service changed its policy in 1968 and by 1970 71 was starting some serious reintroduction of fire at least in select places primarily in the sierra parks the forest service was experimenting in 1972 and reformed its policy in 1978 so there's not a terrible lag the problem is that the forest service has been encumbered by a lot of other things including political controversies over what the national forest should be and who's going to decide. And the agency has been made dysfunctional in some ways by larger political issues over which it has no control. But the Forest Service is so fundamental to the national fire establishment, we have to, we have, to have a functioning forest service that can do all the different things that need, that need to be done and not just react. So we, we all have a vested interest in having them succeed and helping them succeed. So yeah, they've made the policy change. It's not that they don't have their minds right. It's been implementing it and overcoming all the other barriers to that implementation. They have had a harder, much harder uh, slog of it. Just this year, um... In, in the face with this, the early fires that took off earlier in the summer, um, they had this choice to make and it was made to uh, step away from the use policy of, of allowing some fires to burn in certain circumstances. Um, and um, they took a lot of heat and <laughs> it's a lot of heat. They, uh, um, that, the the head of the Forest Service basically had to make a, or made a decision, and I can understand it, that for right now, given this year, given their manpower problems, um, that they they would basically go back to uh, this uh, an attempt to put every fire out as quickly as possible. Um, and then he said, but that doesn't mean we're going to stick with that once we get beyond this crisis. Well, so the question is getting beyond the crisis, that we will go back to uh, a, a broader use of fire and return of fire to the landscape. Yeah, it's a, it's a default position. And I understand this year why they might make that decision. And I don't fault them for it, or the chief for it. I fault him for not saying, we know we're losing ground on this because of this choice. And here's how we're going to make it up. And instead, you just fall further behind. If he had followed up and said, yeah, here's what we're going to do to try to make back what we lost in good fire. And they didn't make that. And I, I'm sorry they didn't. It would have, I would not have been, I would not have criticized them had they done that. Could we talk about a, 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 another success? Apparently it appears that the fire that was threatening South Lake Tahoe, uh, one reason why I mean, an incredible effort went into fighting it. But one reason why it didn't, it, it appears, move rapidly and in, into the urbanized area of South Lake Tahoe, as it has in, in other fires, is that the surrounding forest for some decades now has been worked on and it has been, and this is Forest Service property primarily, has been treated and has been uh, thinned and has been, they've used fire. Um, primarily pile burning, uh, but uh, they've used fire in there. And so the fire, as it approached, um, one reason that they were able to, to get control of the Calder fire, this one was, um, is that they had that zone, that they had uh, done a, a, a good job on, I would say, over the decades, uh, getting that forest ready for this fire. And that's a, that's a success story for the Forest Service. The Angora fire, I think it was in 2007, had burned at the South um, Lake Tahoe area. And in response to that, they started a very complicated uh, problem, a very complicated 
rehabilitation of that landscape, getting ready so they would not have it repeated. And they've got all kinds of difficulties. I mean, you're in this basin, everything they do, uh, they would describe they're in a giant fishbowl. And any smoke that they set up is going to sit in this basin. And it's not just money, it's social capital, as well as political capital, the amount of effort you have to make to engage with people to get something done at this when not everybody agrees is a huge undertaking. And I think they succeeded and they should be, they should be very proud of that. Before we close out, we do have a few more questions. Um, we have two from Paul. It says, do you think that the presence and resonance of fire and myth and art has changed during what you seem to be describing as recent years of relative complacency regarding fire? Or what do you foresee re our reckonings with fire and art and myth in the coming years? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I've been interested in both. Uh, how, how is fire and humanity's relationship to fire represented in myth? And all societies have got myths on the origin of fire. And in almost all cases, that is when whatever creature we were before becomes human. And we're sort of non-entities. Then we get fire and we go to the top of the food chain. Fire, fire is, our, is our great power. But there are also myths where uh, the, the holder of fire doesn't want to share. Um, there's a lot of greed associated and power associated with fire. And there are some where they, they refuse to give it because people won't be able to handle it. They'll misuse it. So that's a great question. And we could probably, it would be interesting to see some new versions of that myth. But also art. I mean, there are countries that have a long tradition of fire art and some that don't. And they could be next door. I mean, Australia has a continuous unbroken tradition for Aboriginal art up to the present day. But Russia has a, a nice tradition of, of fire art. Uh, in 19th, early 20th century, they had formal, uh, the whole school of fire, forest fire painters. Um, Sweden has nothing. The United States has a, a nice mixture of fire art. The heaviest, longest, persistent tradition is in the prairies. Canada has nothing. I can think of one, one fire painting of Canada for, uh, for prairie fire at night. Why? Well, it's just not, there's, their culture isn't, that's not a question that concerns them in the same way. But we're seeing a real revival now in the last decade or so. Lots of artists are getting in. You're seeing fire in novels by people who had had no interest in fire for all their life. Now suddenly fire is part of the background and they're referring to historic fires. They're using fire as an emblem for our general state. So it is really being engaged, the culture is being engaged uh, in ways that had not been true for a long time. I find that encouraging because uh, unless the larger cultures involved, invested in it, can see the meaning of it, it's just this freak thing. I mean, 50 years ago, a fire in California was just some California quirk. It had nothing to do with the rest of the country. Or a fire in Montana, like a grizzly bear attack. It, it not engaged with anything else. That has changed. And that is a remarkable shift. And that gives me some hope that people who are not directly involved with fire are still committed to helping solve it. And I think the other thing that's that's happening is smoke. And we're seeing smoke carrying the effects of fire to places that otherwise would be insulated from it. In many ways, these smoke palls are like the, the great uh, dust bowl blizzards that blew across the country. So we're finding for good reasons and not so good reasons that the culture's engaged. And we're starting to have a discussion that would not have been possible 40 years ago, or even 30 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago. Well, I guess I'll aim this final question at you, David. Okay. So if you were to make one specific suggestion to California's governor in relation to policies, practices, governance regarding fire, what would it be? I only get one. You get one. Maybe we'll, <laughs> two. we'll be generous. <laughs> oh, um, 
housing, housing and zoning. Yeah. Um, it seems ludicrous to continue to plant more uh, disasters in the making by continuing to allow even well thought out as well as we think we they can be um, houses and housing developments in very high known very high risk fire zones um, and and it's a difficult challenge and it's maybe be at the governor's level because these decisions have always been made at the county and city zoning level and the state has not overseen that um, but we have a giant problem and we aren't addressing it and um, so I mean there are some very large proposals right now down in the, the hills north of Los Angeles uh, that make little sense if you looking at from this perspective about uh, putting so many people right into uh, very high fire risk chaparral zones and uh, you know no matter how many fire hydrants they put in and whatever they build the houses out of it's uh, it's it's in the face of all all that we've just been talking about so I think if I have to pick one I can think of some others but uh, that that that's a tough one but that's the one So that's a really good one, especially if we're talking about cities out here on this coast and like how closely packed they are. Housing is, a, is obviously a very, very big issue. Yeah, so I think those are all the questions we've had and we're about two minutes from closing out now. Do either of you have any like final thoughts, like what you want people to take away from this talk? It's a lot to distill <laughs> in a moment. Oh. Thank, can I, I Steve, Steve thanked you at the beginning and I thank you for the invitation to be here. And I noticed you put up the information about uh, Introduction to Fire in California book uh, as a link on your on your from your notes there. And I appreciate that. I see it's on the shelves and it's, in, it's available in, at, the, at the bookstore. So uh, all that is appreciated. So thank mm -hmm. you. Well, thank you. It's a great. It was a great opportunity to to talk to uh, David. We've we've never had a chance to converse like this, so this is a this has been a real pleasure. Yeah, I feel like these these books go really well in conversation with each other, and even better when we have both the authors here to be actually in conversation. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I guess I will close us off. Thank you for our lovely audience and the great questions. They're really thought provoking. Uh, if you know anybody who missed it, I will put it up on YouTube. Thank Sounds you. good. Have a great night, everybody. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.